Welcome to the stage, founder and executive director of Summit Impact, Shira Abramowitz. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so as, a, as mentioned by the Voice of God announcement, my name is Shira Abramowitz. I'm the executive director of Summit Impact. We are the 501c3 social good arm of Summit. Our mission is to activate the power of this community to create a more regenerative and equitable future. We've done that through building a fellowship program where we've supported over 108 fellows from 23 countries around the world. We also are now piloting an impact labs model where we build labs in specific topic areas like our democracy lab and our criminal justice lab. And the big announcement we're sharing is that we're launching a climate lab in January of 2024. So this is your invitation to get involved. We're going to be launching applications, nominations for fellows for that lab. We're going to be building a leadership council. We're going to be refining our topic focus. All of those arenas are places for you to get involved, to share your input, to really be part of co-creating this future with us. So you'll see a few signs around the room that have these QR codes. I think there's one over here. Um, you can scan those and, and sign up to join the Climate Collaboratory. That'll keep you updated with everything about our climate work at Summit Impact. It will also ensure you receive first invitations to our events that we're starting to plan in Paris and at New York Climate Week. And it will give you invitations to join our community co-design calls. We can share your input on what we're building and how you want to shape it. So those are the things to look out for. And today we get to have a taste of getting into some incredible work in climate with two speakers who are really already shaping our climate work at Summit Impact. Pep Bardui and Eric Burlow are brilliant thinkers working on incredible elements and angles of the climate field. And they're also doing work that we're making very foundational to everything we're building at Summit Impact. So consider this session a kind of like taste of the future, an opportunity to, to begin the conversation with us. The way the session is going to work is that Eric is going to share for about 10 minutes, then Pep is going to share for 10 minutes, and then we're going to go into breakouts with each of them. So you'll have the opportunity to be really in discussion with each speaker, and then we'll come back together. That's our morning. How does that sound? So need the mic. OK, so first up, we have Eric Burlow. Eric has been a longtime summit speaker and friend of ours and has an incredible way of making things visible that can, in the most strategic ways, inform the decisions we make and the way we allocate resources and everything we might choose to do in investment and finance and beyond when it comes to climate. Eric is known as a data ecologist. He's an expert in ecology, complexity science, and big data. He's the CEO of Vibrant Data Labs, a company that is building open source tools to empower a growing ecosystem of partners that are tackling the climate crisis. He's also just the best person if you want to go skiing across remote areas of the world, go on adventure trips, learn about what it means to marry a background in ecology and big data and work across different topic areas. So I want to encourage you to find him for many conversations beyond this session as well. But to start, let's give him a really warm welcome, a round of applause. Eric, want to come on out. All right. Thanks, Shira. Thanks so much. Um, Wow, thanks for showing up so early in the morning. I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna, I, I spoke yesterday a little bit about this topic and I'm gonna repeat some of that because I'm assuming that most of you weren't there yesterday. And if you were, hopefully this will be a simpler version. <laughs> um, okay. So the climate crisis is an all hands on deck problem and there's a lot of momentum in this area. In the last year alone, there's an 80% increase in funding to climate solutions, which is really encouraging, but trillions more dollars are required to solve the climate crisis and we don't have a lot of time to waste. So the problem is that funders are literally under fire to make good decisions. And my worry is that a lot of that money might be wasted if we don't really use data to help guide some of those decisions. So we are, everybody needs the big picture. So we um, are building an open source framework to track climate finance called the Climate Finance Tracker. Um, so everybody can see the big picture of who's funding what. Um, so the goal here, I, I'd like to just share with you some insights we're learning and, and a framework that we're developing for easily 
uh, using the data to find high impact opportunities for the funding. Okay, so just first, what is it? Um, the first version of this tracker tracks over 200 and uh, 230 billion of private investments and grants to, to US-based climate relevant companies and nonprofits. And to kind of turn this big blob of grants and investments into a map of who is funding what, we um, go for every entity, every organization that got funded, we go find information about them online, their descriptions, and use their language of how they describe their work to help see order in the chaos. And, we, and, and that allows us to let these organizations self-huddle into climate themes. It comes from the data. And um, so, for example, like renewable energy or um, electric vehicles or natural disasters. So again, every point here is a grantee or an investee, and they're kind of self-organized into these thematic bubbles from the language. So the patterns that we see are not from what the funders say they're doing, but they're from the language of how the investees and the grantees on the ground describe their work, uh, which is really, it's critical, and it's also opens up a lot of doors to other things that I'll show you in a minute. Um, the other, there's a few other unique things about this view. One is that it spans a wide range of topics from climate mitigation to adaptation. Mitigation being, you know, the goal of like net zero carbon drawdown, while adaptation is our ability to just deal with and survive and thrive in the face of the challenges that we're facing, with, you know, heat waves, droughts, fires, flooding, extreme weather events. Um, most of the work I've seen on tracking climate finance focuses on mitigation, on carbon drawdown. Um, and, and it's just critical to see the bigger picture because even in the most optimistic scenarios, we still have like decades of warming to come and, and, and to deal with. Um, and similarly, many people, when, they, when I talk to you about climate finance, they immediately think of renewable energy and, and, re and electric cars. But the problem is a lot bigger. It's, only, it's a critical part, but it's only one part of the bigger picture. We also need full trans, uh, transformation of the, our food system, as well as protecting and restoring 50% of Earth's terrestrial and coastal ecosystems. So, so we wanted to provide this big picture view that otherwise people can't really see if they focus on just renewable energy. Um, and um, another unique aspect is that we synthesize multiple types of money. So in this case, it's philanthropy investments, but the framework is really flexible to add other types of money. Um, and having multiple types allows each to provide context for the other. So as an example here, just quickly, we can see that there, the venture funding is, is concentrated on one side of the map, mostly towards tech and mostly towards this mitigation problem, like carbon drawdown. Um, but there's a huge gap in a lot of other areas, and that's being, uh, oh, sorry, and, and, and a huge concentration of it, these themes right here uh, capture over 75% of the money is in renewable energy and mobility. So it's no wonder that when you talk to people about climate, they often uh, just conflate it with just renewable energy and, and, and mobility when, when there's a lot, it's just one corner of the problem. Um, the gap is being filled by philanthropy in a lot of these areas that are more about protecting nature and transforming the food system and other kind of general adaptation concepts or adaptation problems. So one, one key role of philanthropy is to fill that gap and solve problems that don't actually have a market. But it also can help us see where there's a new market. So for example, we could identify these rare green investments in these red grant dominated themes, um, and that suggests places where there's the beginning of some, some new markets. So for, for example, in particular in the food system, you can see a growing blob of green dots there um, that suggests maybe there, there's, there's room for a, a new market growing in, in regenerative agriculture. Um, this is interesting because if you consider this map maybe 20 years ago, it would the, the electric car bubble would have been mostly grant funded with a few green dots. And so this gives us an insight into where maybe philanthropy can spark new markets. So philanthropy often can fill the gap to find problems that are inherently not profitable to solve and also help make some of those problems more profitable to solve by stimulating a new market. Um, so I also want to just um, outline a framework we're developing for identifying high impact opportunities, even in areas that already have a lot of market momentum. Uh, and the critical framing of it is to focus on the gaps. Um, the gaps are critical for finding impact. Uh, and, and, and 
the reason for that, I wanted to, I'm going to just explain for a second and give you some background. I'm an ecologist by training, as Shira mentioned. I've worked in a wide variety of ecosystems. I'm also a complexity scientist and, and study uh, how just na what nature is a complex system. And, and climate is a really complex system. So let's just think about um, how complex problems work. A simple complex problem is just how to grow a tree. Um, we know that it has a lot of dependencies. It needs water sunlight, nitrogen, phosphorus to grow. These are essential. Um, and if you want to go from a tree to a forest, you also need seed dispersal to scale the tree to multiple sites. Um, and what's, what's difficult about this is that it, there's a, these are all a set of limiting factors that every single one must be present for our goal to be achieved. If any one isn't there, it has veto power over the rest and the whole, the whole endeavor fails. And climate is kind of kind of like that. So like, so if you want to know what's the most impactful thing to fund, it's always the gaps, whatever, whatever is missing. So if there's no water, it doesn't matter how much money went to sunlight, nitrogen or phosphorus, it, the tree won't grow without, unless we fill that gap. And the same thing, if we have a healthy tree growing, but we have no seed dispersal, we'll never scale to a forest. So it's a particular kind of problem that has a, a set of limiting factors and, and climate is similar in that way. So, so we could take any sector in the climate solution space like renewable energy and mobility and um, break it down into these core limiting factors. So we know for the energy transition that we need successful power generation, storage, distribution of that power through the grid, uh, vehicles of all types and charging infrastructure. And, and again, all of these have to be solved, otherwise we lose. Um, and similarly, like growing from a tree to a forest, if we wanna scale energy mobility to 100% of the population, we need social equity in that. In other words, uh, and, and I'm, we can unpack this in the in the breakout session um, in a little bit, which I'm really excited to discuss. But just the bare, basic math of it is if 100% of the people need to be net zero, it only works if 100% of the people have access to all these technologies in, in every sector. Um, so we can look at the data now. Uh, what does it look like? We took advantage of the fact that we have the raw language of how everybody describes their work so we could re-summarize the data by summarizing how much money went to every company or organization that mentions terms related to power generation or power storage or the grid or vehicles or charging and see how what fraction of all the money related to renewable energy and mobility went to those areas and immediately highlight <clears throat> a couple critical gaps where where uh, most of the funding is going to things like solar panels, electric cars, and ba batteries and electric cars, but there's a huge gap in funding connectivity to the grid and charging infrastructure. Um, so it doesn't matter how much money we have, how, wh how good our, our electric cars are if we don't have, or how good our solar farms are, we, if we don't have connectivity to the grid, then we're kind of screwed. And for the scaling question, for the equity question, because we have that raw language of how everybody describes their work, we can re-slice the data and, and measure the fraction of money in each category that's going to companies or organizations that explicitly mention anything intention to address social equity, like energy access, energy poverty, rural communities, um, the urban poor, et cetera. And we can see already here, there's a pervasive gap in social equity funding. And this gap, I think, is really underestimated because many people mention it, but aren't really doing it. But it's, a, but it's clear that this is a huge opportunity for philanthropy or impact finance to, to, to fill the gap and get the tech to everybody. And we start, we're seeing some of that, those trends in the data. So we can see for renewable energy and mobility, there's these two key opportunities. Even though it's a very well-funded area, there's there's opportunities for huge impact for something like philanthropy, which is to fill ecosystem gaps in distribution and charging and also the social equity gap. And this money is highly leveraged because if you solve those problems, you unlock the success of all the money that's going to solar panels, batteries, and electric cars. A third kind of gap that I want to just highlight quickly was raised by one of our partners, Elemental Accelerator, that's uh, in the tech space called the Second Valley of Death, where climate tech startups often die on the vine after they've prototyped their technology, 
in the in the early venture phase, but they they don't make it past that to deploy it in the real world. So they they they, they die in the in the path from innovation to deployment, and it's considered a deployment gap caused by a weak link in the money food chain because they they are not big enough to get a huge project finance. Uh, like a $50 million loan or something like that. And, and they, but they need small project finance just to test their, and vet their technology in real communities on the ground. And, then that, and so the question that Elemental had was, was does well-timed catalytic capital, which is defined here as non-equity funding, like not, not a venture investment, but more a grant or a loan at the right time, help them survive later and raise more money later. So we looked through the history of funding of over 1,400 renewable energy and mobility relevant companies. And we found that um, really interestingly that, that companies that had a prior, prior grant early on were more likely to survive to late venture, twice as likely. And, and late and post-venture companies that had an early loan at the right time were three and a half to, they, they raised three and a half to five times more total funding than, than you'd expect by chance. And this is, to my knowledge, the first sort of empirical validation of this idea that catalytic capital can be catalytic, um, that there's room for grants and concessionary loans in, in the climate tech ecosystem. And Elemental is already using this to present to the White House about using Inflation Reduction Act money to specifically target this high impact gap. So that is a tour, a quick tour of the climate finance tracker. Uh, it's publicly available online, um, and we're using and just just a you know a little tour of how we're trying to use the data to develop a framework to to reslice it in many ways to identify different types of high impact opportunities. Here I presented three. One is to use the language to break down a problem in any sector, and then and identify what areas of, you know, what were the key parts of that ecosystem that are un underfunded, that are limiting factors, that if you solve them, it unlocks the solutions to everything else that's well-funded. The second is um, th filling this social equity gap that's really critical for just getting the tech out to everybody. And, um, and then finally is solving this deployment gap, which is caused by a weak link in the money food chain. So the tracker is available publicly for anybody to explore. It's at impactalpha.com slash CFT for climate finance tracker. And, and we, um, we, there's other trackers there too. We just launched a co-investment tracker and, and a prototype for Latin America and Africa. And if you please feel free to reach out if you have questions about it or if you discover some interesting patterns in there that um, we didn't think to explore. Um, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Eric. Um, so next we have uh, Pep, who's gonna share with us a different angle of the work she's doing on climate. And then as a reminder, after this, we're gonna break out into groups and discussion. And in addition to being one of my favorite new friends from Summit Palm Desert, so any of you who were there, you might've met her, Pep is a brilliant thinker and strategist and has an incredible and a very impressive background working across business, government, NGOs in over 20 countries. In her work across climate resilience, human rights, and sustainability, Pep has co-authored 20 papers on energy access and climate resilience. She worked with the International Finance Corporation, scaling up commercially viable off-grid energy access in business models in Africa and Asia, and led the Climate Resilience Execution Agency for Dominica. She has worked with McKinsey and Company and advised companies and governments in a dozen countries on strategy, or organizational design, and operational development. So she has a wide background of working in a variety of environments. And today we get to hear from her about some exciting new work that she's doing with the Prime Minister of Barbados, Prime Minister Motley, on looking at Bridgetown 2.0, and what the future might hold for understanding the global landscape of finance and climate equity. And the thing I wanna invite you into is when I met Pep at Summit Palm Desert, she said, I'm about to take on this big role. I think it's gonna happen. I really need a community of people around me to support me, to be in this with me. I think Summit could be that community. I think people here could be part of this work with me. And so this is the invitation today. We're gonna to get to hear about her work and really dive in with her. So let's give her a really, really warm welcome and big round of applause. 
Yeah. Morning, morning, morning. I am going to ask to cue this video because this will help you understand why I need your support over the coming two years. Um, the lady you're going to hear speaking, Prime Minister Motley, is my new boss, and she doesn't play. So... Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic has taught us that national solutions to global problems do not work. We come to Glasgow with global ambition to save our people and to save our planet, but we now find three gaps on mitigation, climate pledges or NDCs. Without more, we will leave the world on a pathway to 2.7 degrees, and with more, we are still likely to get to two degrees. These commitments made by some are based on technologies yet to be developed, and this is at best reckless and at worst dangerous. On finance, we are $20 billion short of the 100 billion, and this commitment, even then, might only be met in 2023. On adaptation, adaptation finance remains only at 25%, not the 50-50 split that was promised nor needed given the warming that is already taking place on this earth. Climate finance to frontline small island developing states declined by 25% in 2019. Failure to provide the critical finance and that of loss and damage is measured, my friends, in lives and livelihoods in our communities. So you get the this idea. This is immoral, and it is. So you get the idea. This woman is powerful and she's inspirational, but she's also trying to change the global architecture while running a small island state. So she effectively has two roles, and that's what she's asked me to support her on. I'm going to carry two hats. Um, I'm currently with the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank Group, but I will be joining her team to support this so-called Bridgetown Agenda, which is looking at how Barbados can help push uh, the change in the climate finance landscape for small island developing states and for all climate vulnerable states uh, around the world, regardless of what part uh, or which continent they're on and also to support the agenda of Barbados itself. Barbados needs to walk the talk and demonstrate that small countries can do things differently, and hopefully over time that's going to change the way the financial architecture works. So what is the Bridgetown Initiative? There are effectively three pieces to it. One is saying that the global financial architecture is not making enough money available, so the volume of capital. The second is that the money that is available is not flexible enough. There are a whole bunch of conditions, certain countries get it, certain you know, preconditions need to be met, um, and how countries spend that money is restricted. And then the third piece is what we all know, which is there's never gonna be enough public funding to cover the financing needs of vulnerable states. We need to bring the private sector in. How do you do that? You don't bring the private sector in by saying there's not enough public money, so you have to come in and help. You have to make a business case for it. And when we talk about the volume of money needed, it is at least 1.5 to $2 trillion US dollars dinero cash money every year. Not a one-off, every single year. And that money needs to be catalyzed somehow. Um, I'll skip through this slide, but what it basically shows is that not all money is equal, right? There's money that falls into three categories. Basically, you need money that is commercially viable, that's looking for a financial return, and that can really attract investors who want their money back. There's a second pile of money, which is grants. There's no way that you're going to be able to get a return on schools Pakistan has lost 28,000 schools because of floods that affected 30 million people. That's not going to look for a financial return. That has to look for a social return, so that's grant capital. And then there's money in the middle, which is what I call quasi-commercial. It's risk capital. You need people to bring equity in. You need grants um, in, in the form of kind of guarantees. You need blended finance to bring down the cost of financing or the cost of capital for certain types of projects. And that sits somewhere in between. And not all donors or investors can bring the same type of money. So when we think about the second piece, which is 
not just the volume of capital, but who gets that money and what type of money, um, what type of gap does that close? Essentially, small island developing states in the Caribbean, but also in the Pacific, are typically considered middle to high income. They have a certain GDP, but because their population, I come from Dominica, 70,000 people, but there are other islands that have way smaller populations, 20, 30,000 people. Because their populations are small, their GDP per capita is high. And when you look at the rules of financing institutions, for example, the World Bank Group, but also other development partners, they'll say, well, your income level per capita is way too high, so we're not going to give you grants. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I think the second thing is that, you know, small island states in particular, but also many coastline countries are not only affected by climate change, they're affected by other natural hazards. Um, earthquakes, tsunamis, those are not climatically linked, but that kind of piles up the amount of financing that they need to deal with natural disasters in general. The third piece is that small island states run a vicious cycle of having to borrow money to address climate catastrophes, which puts them into debt. So their, their per capita GDP is high, but their debt to GDP ratio is even higher. And you get in a cycle where you're bor borrowing way more money than you can afford, according, for example, to the IMF. Therefore, international institutions say you're not credit worthy, so we can't lend to you. So you need more money. You borrow the money to deal with your cli uh, climate issues. Um, and then you're told that you can't borrow any more money. You get into this vicious cycle. I think the third point is that if you look at the most heavily indebted countries, it's kind of hard to see, but if you look at point four, Bahrain, Barbados, Belize, including Dominica, right, but also countries like Singapore and Suriname have debt to GDP ratios which are extremely high. They're above 100%, and the typical debt sustainability level is indicatively set at about 60%. So the countries that are the most vulnerable to catastrophes are the least able to borrow. And then I think the final point, which is the one that we should rest on for just a second, is that while money is being made available, SIDS, so small island developing states, collectively received $1.5 billion in climate finance between 2016 and 2020. So $1.5 billion is a small amount. But when you look at the amount of money that they paid back in terms of debt servicing, their interest was $26.6 billion. So, you know, you ask the question, I have to borrow myself out of this hole, right? But I'm not really getting, um, I'm not really getting to where I need to be. The second challenge, pr primarily for small island developing states, is that many of them are reliant on industries which are fundamentally climate vulnerable. So if you look at this chart as well, you'll see that up to 60%, you know, in Aruba, in Antigua and Barbuda, of the economy is dependent on tourism revenue. Well, it just takes one hurricane for that entire portion of the economy to be wiped out. So not only are you climate vulnerable, but your industries are susceptible to be removed from the planet. So, you know, these countries were hit, um, you know, after hurricanes. Dominica, where I'm from, lost 226% of its GDP after a four hour storm. But when COVID hit, for three years, these economies were pummeled. So the question that I would like to address now, specifically focusing on my second hat, which is Barbados, is how do you get out of this quagmire where your climate finance is limited, but your economic base, the basis on which you know, your country is going to develop both socially and economically, is fundamentally fragile? If we take the case of Barbados, a tiny country of about 430 square kilometers, which, by the way, um, you know, it's kind of interesting because it's about two and a half times the size of Washington, D.C., which is where I live, um, has a small landmass, but about 400 and 420 times its landmass in marine territory, right? So that tells you that you have something to work with. It's just not your terrestrial zone. Barbados was known as one of the first ports of call for the slave trade, right? Um, an entire history Generations of innovation and slavery began in Barbados many hundred years ago. That's all changed. Barbados is now a country of about 300,000 people. It's known for many things. It's known for crop over. So if you're around in August and you want to come to a good carnival, come there. It's known for Rihanna. It's known for tourism. The question is, what is the future of Barbados? How do you build a country that's much more sustainable? And that's what I would like to talk about. We can look at this slide in a little bit more detail if you come to the breakout that will focus specifically on Barbados. But the island is throwing out some crazy cool ideas, everything from vaccines 
to you know biotech, to CBD, but also to innovation um, that I think we're going to need some of the fresh thinking that's on this boat to, uh, to channel. So what is it going to take for us to get there? Um, not entirely clear. Hopefully you're going to help me answer that question. Uh, and in the meantime, um, I look forward to seeing you in the breakouts. But you know it's about time that she come back. You know. Yeah. Can't be scared when it goes down. Got a problem, tell me now. Only thing that's on my mind is who's gonna run this town tonight. Let's give Pep and Eric a big round of applause. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully now you can see why I think these are just two fantastic, brilliant, interesting thinkers that are worth diving in with, learning more with, and also getting involved in their work. So that's the opportunity we have next. We're a little bit tight on timing, so we're going to move some things around. But basically what's going to happen is we're going to split up into breakout groups. We're going to have Eric with one group on this side of the room. We're going to have Pep with another group on this side of the room. You can choose whichever group you want to join. Um, also, they'll be on the ship for the next few days. So if you want to go to both, you'll have time to connect with them later as well. Um, and there's a climate investment meetup at 11 a.m. today. So that's another great opportunity to continue these conversations. So for the breakouts, one side over here with Eric. Shante will be our facilitator. She's back there. Um, on this side will be Pep with Ashlea. They'll give you some instructions when you get there. The main thing to know is just, sorry, I don't know if this is cutting out. The main thing to know is just to enjoy it. Bring your ideas. Share what you have to know, ask good questions, and we'll see you back here in about 20 minutes all together. Shante Harris, I'm happy that you all chose to join us today. I'm on Summit Impact's board, so I'd love to stay in touch with all of you as we build out our climate collaboratory and really think about engaging this audience. Um, Eric and I had the question of how do you think about allocating resources so that the climate space is more equitable. And I think one of the biggest highlights from our conversation was this question of messaging and communication, acknowledging that stakeholders are coming into this from very different angles and have different incentives. So what does it look like for us to all equip ourselves and equip founders with understanding how do they actually share what they're building, whether that's market value or equity or justice or nature, understanding the role of communication so that we're bringing others along while we also want to be more equitable. Uh, we also talked about what are different ways that we can start to pilot that. Uh, so one of the things that came up was this concept of innovation sandboxes. So what does it look like to bring government, technology, and community together to actually deploy and iterate rather than what I think we oftentimes see, which is the technology being deployed and then things going wrong and we're all like, oh no, this isn't what we wanted. It's is supposed to be for community. Um, so yeah, I think the other piece that was really interesting was this question of uh, values. So what are we actually solving for? I know that that came up in both Eric and Pet's you know, uh, overall overview of their work. And I think it's really important that we're thinking about the values that we are, that is actually underlining the work that each of us do. So I think that's probably, uh, <laughs> do you want to add anything? Yeah, I guess I'll just add that, you know, the recurring theme is just sort of how do we make equity and justice a core part of the strategy that that's like, it's it's not a, an add on, but it's actually the answer to the problem. Um, and embed that in the business strategy explicitly in, in the investment goals, um, not because it's a nice thing to do, but because it's actually the, the best thing to do, you know, the, so, yeah. 
Um, all right, I'll pass over to Amy. Thanks, Amy Christensen. I've been a summit person since the first SAS in 2011 when we talked climate jigger Shaw and I talked climate strategy. Um, so it, I think it was such a great discussion. Obviously felt like we wanted to spend another three hours with you, so I'm sorry it was really fast. But um, what, what I heard was a lot of excitement and potential opportunity, of course, in the energy sector. And so we talked about the concept of offshore wind and what could be done there and the challenge of scaling that. We also... Um, you know, one idea was good, that I, I put forward was, you know, could we gather together um, the small island developing states and do more of a larger scale offshore wind initiative where an individual country may not um, have the ability to attract investment because it's a smaller scale investment. We talked about um, uh, the challenge. Is there an opportunity with hydrogen um, because they're found natural gas recently and oil develop don't want to develop the oil, but maybe the natural gas could that then uh, provide an opportunity in the to create a hydrogen economy? Could we use hydrogen to actually fuel ships um, and decarbonize shipping um, and have Barbados be a little kind of micro hub? Um, we talked about can we localize the energy and food systems on the island? So in addition to creating more of an export economy um, in electricity from offshore wind or in, in hydrogen, could we also create a more robust and resilient domestic economy by doing more local food and more local energy? Um, and that would also help to diversify the economy away from just the um, focus on tourism. But also there were um, cultural challenges because farming is what um, they was done in slavery. And so people don't want to do farming and also farming is really hard. And so it's a, a tough job that not everyone else does. So there's some cultural challenges there as well. Um, and let's see, what did I miss? Oh, oh, ideas around the blue economy. So can we tap into, um, there's a lot of people investing in carbon offsets to um, do um, seaweed and turtle seagrasses um, and mangrove restoration, as we heard from Tom yesterday with the excitement, exciting rapid restoration of mangroves. And so can we leverage some of that carbon money and the innovation of technology to um, build some blue economy opportunities, um, including potentially, um, we talked about offshore aqua farming and what could that look like? So a little bit of that. Um, so I think a lot of ideas um, and the challenge that we heard is assessing those ideas and what really makes sense culturally, economically, and given the scale. Um, and are there some opportunities for interconnecting the Caribbean region a bit more and kind of having um, Barbados be the center to then drive? Um, yeah. Thank you, Amy. Ah, thank you. Um, it's these are fantastic summaries of so much content in depth. And I hope you're all feeling what I'm feeling, which is that this is very much a beginning point, right? There's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot that might come out of the connections and conversation happening in this room right now. And it's possible that even in a couple of years, this group right here will look back at the fact that we were in this room on this very funny cruise ship at this big event talking about these things and we'll see the work that PEP does in Barbados and that hopefully we get to be part of. We'll see the way the climate finance tracker evolves and the kind of mapping and visibility we gain in the field. And we'll remember what it meant to be starting these conversations now. And that's really our hope at Summit Impact is that we're here not just to learn and absorb content, but to really be in the conversation together, to be building together, to be building the kind of friendships that will allow us to collaborate for years to come. So our main ask is really just to join us to continue that conversation. Um, look out for these QR codes. We also have our ocean action guides around, which feature some of our oceans partners on board. And uh, we also have another session tomorrow evening at 5.30 where Carolina will be, as well as like, two other entrepreneurs doing something kind of similar of a presentation and then a breakout. Um, so just continue the conversation with us, continue to be involved, and please do let us know if fantastic, fun co connection points and work comes out of the connections that you make here. We'd love to keep tracking these stories and sharing them with the community so we can engage more and more people from Summit in everything that we're doing here. Um, so with that, I want us to give a really big thank you to Eric and to Pep. Thank you. And to everyone for really bringing yourself and your ideas and your creativity to the conversation today. My name is Shira. 
Shante is on my team. I think Meredith's out of the room now, but Ashlea over there, Kate is over there. Feel free to find us anytime if you have any questions or would like to learn more. Um, next up in this room is going to be Nasreen speaking. I think she's at the back over there at 1045. And she has probably one of the most powerful stories that is on this ship. So if you are looking for some inspiration and heart opening and to understand a little bit more about a very related topic to what we discussed in terms of modern slavery and the clothing industry and consumption more broadly, that'll be in this room at 1045. Thanks, everyone. See you soon.